Hello everybody. In this episode of avionicsteducation.com, I'm going to give you a chance to earn your certified avionics technician badge. Well, your certified YouTube avionics technician badge. We're going to learn about troubleshooting a wire. Welcome aviation enthusiasts and dreamers. If we haven't met before, my name is Bruce Bissett. I am an expert in all things airplanes. I'm a 40 year survivor in the aviation industry. I teach avionics, maintenance, aircraft ownership, and FAA regulations. I teach both online and in classrooms. My students come from high school, colleges, repair stations, and the FAA Academy. So let's start a conversation and shed some light on this wild world of aviation. Hello, welcome back everybody. My name is Bruce Bissett. Like I said before, my channel is called Avionics Education. And I try to have good information every week. And your comments actually have said pretty good. So also remember, I want to see some comments on here uh, with people coming in. Um, I gave some warning that the show was coming out, that we were going to be doing something on troubleshooting of, a, of an aircraft wire. But I'm going to pick on a, a little more advanced than a typical GA aircraft. When I look at my channel, the most popular videos that are on my channel that people look at are those avionic technician skill videos. In fact, the, the highest rated one is actually the one on aircraft wiring, specifically the one I do on a connector. So I'm going to create another one of those videos tonight. Now that first wiring video, uh, the connector one, was actually just on an alark. We were going on the COVID lockdown. Uh, I had just come back from Oklahoma City from a job and I didn't know what to do. So I went through and grabbed a PowerPoint presentation I did for my school and went through and just did a presentation and as it turns out that gets views every week so we're going to do another one similar to that we're going to talk about aircraft wiring troubleshooting so i do have kind of a presentation put together and, and we're going to talk uh about um a, a scenario that's not going to be too difficult but we are going to get into a lot of the connectors and wires and things like that for a particular aircraft. Now, just as a reminder, if this is your first time on my channel, don't forget to subscribe and also hit that share button to help spread the word about what am I doing on this channel. Also press that like button if you're getting something useful from this video and many of the other videos. And I love the chat page. During the live feed, I always read your chats and I answer your questions on the feed. So I'm hoping that I get more people to chat it. So don't forget to come in and chime in. Well, as me, as you may notice, I have a Boeing 737 up on the screen. Well, today's exercise is all about this air carrier aircraft. Because for most of my 40 plus years in aviation, the Boeing 737 has the most effect on my life. It's actually been the one I've interacted the most. I first started working as an avionics technician in 1989, where I learned about wiring diagrams, ATA chapter 20, uh, how to read schematics, how to deal with connectors and cannon plugs, and how to most importantly troubleshoot systems. Those first aircraft that I got to work on were 100s, 200s, 300s. They were the first early variants of the 737. 100s and 200s had the long thin engine on it. Later on, because I had my A&P certificate and my avionics experience, I changed airlines and started working both as an avionics and mechanical systems for an airline that ran pretty much exclusively 737s. While at my second airline, I had the chance to earn my type rating in the 737 as a pilot. So it's an aircraft I know very well as avionics, maintenance, and as a pilot. Let's see, no chats today? No, nothing yet. I know there's people out there. Hey, lots of people out there. So the exercise that we're going to look at today is a scenario that involves, I'm going to pick on the next gen aircraft. This is what I would call the in-between aircraft. We used to talk about the classic 737s, which was a 1, 2, 3, 4, 500 Boeings. And then Boeing came out with the next gen, which was the all glass aircraft. And that's what you're looking at here. These had the glass displays. We still had mechanical gauges on it and we still had um, 
avionics, we had avionics data buses, our air and communications, but we also still had a lot of analog system. So I picked this aircraft because it has some relatively simple wiring diagrams to pick on for us to kind of go over first. Okay, we're not going to get into the avionics data buses that, that drive the screens that you see here. For what I want to do for this exercise is I'm going to start much simpler. So the first slide. Now, before we get too deep into the project, I need to go through and kind of highlight some, some troubleshooting guidelines when it talks about working on any avionics aircraft. The first guideline, and then we say a rule, but it's more like a guideline. Never troubleshoot a malfunctioning system unless you fully understand how the system is supposed to operate normally. You would think that would be an obvious you know, situation to be in, but you'll be surprised to find out that a lot of people work on aircraft that don't have a full understanding of the complete system. Now, you understand a light. If I'm working on a landing light or position light on the aircraft, turn a switch on, light comes on, turn a switch off, light goes off. Okay, you've got a full functioning. We're gonna deal with something similar to this. Uh, we're gonna play with this panel here that I'm showing on the screen. But as we get more complicated, autopilot, flight directors, flight management systems, things like that, that takes more time and energy because that takes a lot more uh, knowledge and also using the maintenance manuals more closely because maintenance manuals are written to help us troubleshoot these parts. The next rule is always be aware of the electrical state of the aircraft. Now make sure that you are troubleshooting a circuit if you're using an ohm meter then that aircraft needs to be stone cold out. It means all the power unplugged, all the batteries uh, disconnected, unplugged. Now the first exercise we're going to do, and we're going to be kind of doing it with power on. So my hope is, is that, that you've done this before. This is just a basic outline. But then we'll get into looking at uh, chasing the wires when it's cold. And we would change our multimeter function. And the reason why we want it cold meaning power out, is we're going to be disconnecting, isolating the battery. We're going to be going through and connecting jumpers into the aircraft. And we don't want to put voltage into our meter in the wrong place. We're also the same sense. I don't want to be putting voltage in the wrong place using my jumpers. We'll talk about jumpers here in a moment. Another rule, um, working for a large airline or carriers, always review to see if the discrepancy has a history. I had learned a long time, and especially my second company I worked for, is that by the time they called somebody with avionics experience, um, it had gone through a number of hands. And the system that we're going to be playing with can be MEL'd, which means it could be deferred. Otherwise, they could do something, make it fly. It's not a, not a totally unsafe situation. So it's going to have history. Don't repeat history. You don't want to go through and redo something that's already been done. Changing the LRUs is something that mechanics tend to do fairly quickly because it's something that even if you have a minimal knowledge of the system, you understand putting in a uh, line replaceable unit and then doing a system test is good enough. Chasing wires takes a little more skills. Let's talk about the next slide. Have a plan. E most of the time when I'm working discrepancies on an aircraft, before I go out to the aircraft, I'm going to know what the problem is going to be. I'm going to look at the history. I'm going to look at the work that's been previously done. And I'm going to go through and make sure I have the right documentation with me. And we're going to talk about the fact that wiring diagrams are not as simple as, as they seem. The way they're written. There's a lot of different versions of wiring diagrams. And there's a, we're all going to talk about these types of air carrier diagrams. They're really, once you learn the system, are actually pretty easy to work at. But the trick is that these aircraft get modified over time. And we need to find the right uh, sheet to work from. The other thing we need to have is the correct tools. Uh, if I'm not going to be using a multimeter to test voltages or we're going to be returning to services by testing voltages or resistance, then I'm not required to have a calibrated multimeter for the check. I just need something I'm going to use for troubleshooting. Uh, so I could have my what I call my toolbox that it's actually labeled when I was in at the first airline. It was tagged for troubleshooting only. I would have to change it if I needed a meter for return to service. I'm going to have my jumpers. Never, ever, 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 ever put safety wire inside a connector. You only want to use jumpers, and I wish I had them here. I, I would normally have these jumpers that I had made. They have a male and a female socket on the end for the different can of plugs I have, different sizes. And that allowed me to put 
uh, uh, essentially into the socket of pin, a fresh pin, one that wasn't damaged, so that I make sure I have good contact when I'm doing it, when I'm testing it with the meter. And we'll show that here in a second. Biggest one is know where stuff is. Locate the components, where things are going to be. Um, the issue with uh, with that is you're going to have disconnects. You'll have the hopefully the wiring diagram in front of you ready to go. You're going to have to be able to then notice on the wiring diagram. We'll cover this in a second how to understand where things are on an aircraft. Again, once you learn the system, it is a breeze to be able to navigate, work, work uh, troubleshooting, and finding all these panels. We're going to learn about ATA Chapter 91. 91 is a chapter that's used for um, aircraft wiring panels. And so I'm going to show a sample of that here in a second. So we're going to have our planning done and have an idea of where things are. There's a tip on here, so you're wiring outside the fuselage where it's more than inside the cabin. If I'm doing um, an exercise we did with my students for uh, landing light, for example, we would look at where that wing to body connection was between the inside of the airplane and the outside of the fuselage. We want to make sure that I could check all the wiring inside the fuselage first, then go to the wiring on the outside of the fuselage. Next one, always keep track of your progress as you're performing the troubleshooting. Have a notepad with you. I, old school, I print out the wiring diagram that I'm working with. I print it out and I date it so I know who did it, who would print it out in case I have to give it to another technician. And then me, I'm going to put a wiring, uh, a highlighter mark on the wire that I checked so that it tells another person if I can't get it done in this shift that, hey, I've tested this wire, I've tested that wire, it's good, it's good, still has a problem, and then I've gone to here. So the whole object of this thing is to make a note of, one, every wire that I've checked along the way, and two, every disconnect I removed. If I had to remove an electrical connector from various locations on the aircraft, my issue is I got to make sure I put them back and test the systems to make sure that those connectors are seated. We're going to go through a, um, a listing here of that in a minute. So let's get to our discrepancy. Uh, our make-believe discrepancy is on this panel right here, and this is the electrical control panel. All this panel does on a 737, it's mechanical, so it's, it's above the pilot's head. We call it the P5 panel. I'm going to throw some acronyms at you today, so bear with me. Uh, and a couple things here that are kind of important. So, so the discrepancy is the pilot is selecting TR1. TR stands for Transformer Rectifier. Okay, that means it want, the uh, pilot wants to check to make sure that the Transformer Rectifier is providing voltage to his proper panel. If you, could, if you would look above here, let me put my arrow up here so you can see it. Eh, it doesn't show. In the upper window, you can see DC amps in the red box, and it's showing two dashed lines, which means it's not receiving an indication. Say troubleshooting 101, you got to make sure, well, is it an indication problem or is it a system problem? The indicator is blank, I understand that, but the issue is, okay, is the transfer rectifier put out voltage? The easiest way to tell on a glass cockpit aircraft is you look at the ICAST system. The ICAST system, let me pull that screen back up. The ICAST system's in the center display there, and it puts out warning signs when things are turned off. Since I, since this is bus or DC bus one, there's a there would be a lot of warning signs of things not functioning. Also, the aircraft was dispatched, so there would be no way this thing would be allowed to fly with that broken. Okay, so I, I have an indication problem. I do not have a system problem. Finally, thing to remember here, I'm going to go ahead and blank my little screen here. Um, uh, here we go. Is the ship number was 737. And the other thing we need to make sure of is the effectivity number. And I'll talk about effectivity number here in uh, a fraction of a second to show it to you. So just remember YB596, because well, that's going to come up here in a second. And, and before we get too carried away, let me just basically go over very quickly what this panel is for. This side in the red box is the system for all the DC indication. So we've got the main battery, aux battery, if there's one installed, transform rectifier one, two, and three, 
there's a test function. You go through and turn it to test and it blanks out the symbols. You've got standby power and bus battery bus power. So this switch here, as you rotate it around, will put the displays in the red box above it where it shows the red box. Of course, the airplane another red box. On the right hand side display are the AC power supplies to the aircraft. And I'll show that in a second. A uh, couple of things down below. We've got the main battery switch, which is the black guarded switch on the DC side. That allows us to disconnect the battery from the buses, um, all but the, we'll call the hot battery buses. And then on the right hand side is the galley power, believe it or not, it's also on this panel. Uh, I won't get into the battery discharge TR unit in the electrics page because these are just warning lights um, that are tied to the master caution system that say if there's a problem, since this pilot, since this panel's on the overhead, it's out of the pilot's view. If something happens, the battery starts discharging, uh, a TR unit malfunctions, or you have any other problem in the electrical panel, this actually will send a warning to the pilot in front of the person flying so they can see it. Real quick, we're going to briefly talk about, this is the AC power system on the aircraft. Two engines, two generators. Middle generator is an APU, the auxiliary power unit. The way the APU works is that it could power either bus. There's only two, and a bus just is a name for a common power connection. There's AC transfer bus one and AC transfer bus two that powers either engine one or engine two. Or in the middle here, you can see that you have the APU BTB, which stands for bus type breaker. The APU can power one or both buses at any time. And then those arrows go down to the other buses that feed the systems in the aircraft that require AC power. We go to the next page, and this gets down to the DC power system where we're working at. So if you follow the blue line from the AC transfer bus, now this is an AC signal coming out of the airplane right now, and it goes to, there's one section goes to TR1, which stands for transformer rectifier. Transformer rectifier does two things. One, it takes the 115 volts and drops it to 28 volts, which is the transformation part. And the rectification is one that turns it from a uh, AC power system to a DC power system. That's what a DR uh, transfer, transfer rectifier does. TR1 for bus one, a DC bus one, and TR2 from engine two for DC bus two. And we'll get to the rest of the stuff. That's, a, that's another class we can talk about. Just understand that the whole point is that if I didn't have anything functioning from TR1, then DC bus one would not be getting its power and you get a lot of messages. We don't have to worry about messages. Okay, now what we're gonna do next is look at the history. I go back into the maintenance records and it shows that the overhead panel, which was the P5 panel, it's a couple connectors on the overhead. We'll talk about those connectors in a few minutes. And the module that replaced it was done at an outstation. That didn't fix the problem. They had a benefit of having three transfer rectifiers, the number three one being a standby, they swapped the number one for the number three and they still had an indication problem on the number one. So we've isolated the transfer rectifier and we've isolated the overhead panel. So we're down to wiring. So the next thing that we're going to be doing is that we're going to go and get, a, get the right wiring diagram. And since we know this is a DC generation indication system, so we go to the wiring diagram, it's ATA chapter 24, all right? And we look up under the title, there we go. We find 243311, but look closely. You notice that we have two sheets that are represented on that. That's where those effectivity number came into it. What an effectivity is, what that means is that you know, airplanes have the end numbers. They have serial numbers when they're manufactured. But an effectivity number is the affection of the version, the electrical version number. So what will change the effectivity? Now notice if you look on the wiring diagram manual here, uh, here on the, here, you can see that DC bunts indication for the DFDAU which is a uh, digital flight data acquisition unit. You notice that it says all here. Uh, reason being that for this system, the wires that run 
to the DFDU, DFDAU, um, has not been changed. So the activity for that system is for all aircraft when I'm looking at it. However, for the airplanes above, there was something that was done in the history to change the schematics for these series of aircraft. And the aircraft up in the top sheet had uh, one version of an electrical change. Could have been anything from the way the overhead panels read to give information to the pilots to the bottle of the transfer rectifier. It could be any different reason why uh, you'd have a change to the effectivity. Uh, and then a different one down below. So we're gonna go figure out which one it is. We're gonna go ahead and pull up our wiring diagram and I pull it up here. And like I said, there's not much to this system. It looks intimidating until we go through it piece at a time. But we go down to the bottom of the page and it has the last revision, which we knew about. This was 243311. The aircraft's effectivity we knew because we, it comes up on the maintenance uh, uh, worksheet for the airplane. And I now look for YB596. Well. Um, here's YB565 to YB672. So this diagram is for the airplane I'm working on. I've got the right diagram. So now I'm just going to briefly, and I'll zoom in, zoom out, what we're looking at here. Okay, starting with the circuit breaker panels here on the far right hand side. Let me bear with me while I zoom in here a little bit. There we go. I knew I could do that. So we've got the circuit breakers on the right hand side. Then we move to the right now on the left hand side, excuse me, gosh. One rule about the electrical wiring schematics for most ATA uh, called out aircraft is that they always start with the upper left corner of the page. We'll start with the wire diagram Then we'll cover that box here in a second. And then it moves to the end unit as you come right side of the page. And I'll have more than one page. If you get into more complicated pages, it'll say next page, next page as it goes in. Okay, we keep on going across. So we've got, hang on a second, let me move this bear over. Nope, that didn't help me. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close it down a little bit here. So we have a set of connectors that we're going to be looking at. We've got multiple locations. So each of these black boxes that you're starting with, you say set a, on the left-hand side of the screen where the circuit breakers are, that's one location. You'll see the wires move across to the right, and it goes to the next location. In this case, it's going to be the flight the pilot overhead panel. Sorry which becomes the actual module itself in the overhead panel. That was already changed. It keeps on moving to the right-hand side of the page um, to a junction box, or this was actually in the uh, equipment bay. And these are just, believe it or not, just uh, when the wires come into a central location, like a big bay of the, of the uh, aircraft, and I'll show you that picture here in a second, you'll sometimes just have wires that loop around inside on the rack. So this has its own rack. Then it comes out of that rack and goes to the rack itself where the transfer rectifier units are. And that's what these are on the far um, on the far right hand side of the page. I wish I had a point. I wish I had a pointer. Oh there's my pointer. Yeah and I didn't know I had it. So um, so it starts with the circuit breaker panel to the overhead panel to the first equipment bay rack to the final equipment bay rack. Okay, so that is our wiring diagram. So anybody here want to say anything so far before I move on? Any questions? Any questions so far? Anybody? I know people are out there as I have 23 people. I already talked about the fact, the fact that we worked on the... Hey, Herman's back. Thank you. Let's pick on the diagram a little bit here. And I'm just going to the first section past the... Um, uh, the overhead panel. And this is the junction box inside the E1-4 shelf. And I'll show you where that is in a second. That is in a separate location on the aircraft. Okay, 
the black box you can see going all the way around. Here we go. The black box that you can see going all the way around, everything inside that black box, all the wiring inside that black box, because this is a junction, begins with wire number 0141. Then it goes dash, and then the individual numbers that we'll be looking at. So this is the first number here is 2251B24 stands for blue because if you see on the other side where it comes in you can see a little twist there that means it's a twisted double um, wire and you can see this symbol here means shielded so it's a twisted double shielded wire or at least this is twisted here this is a double shielded here because it's just showing the shield we have two wires one's blue one's red they're both the last digit on an aircraft wiring is the size of the wire. It's a 24 gauge wire. And then these are all the wire numbers. So here's 2251B24, 2252B24, and 225B24. Wires are probably, since these are basically new to the aircraft, are tied to the system that they're plugged into. Uh, looking around here on the very bottom, here's the, here's a disconnect number. You'll see the D number will actually have two parts of it. Uh, we'll pick on D440560 is the disconnect number. The J represents the receptacle. The receptacles, that part, that part of the electrical connector, it's got uh, mounts to it. It's actually physically connected to a panel, a rack. It's physically mounted to the aircraft structure, which means it's mate the P section will be the plug, the part that you could physically unhook and remove from the aircraft system. So the P and the J, the number will share all the way across. So this number here is 405660J, and then this goes through out the rack to 40490JP. Plugs here, receptacle here. So that's kind of basically how to read it. Now the rest of this stuff would be talking about modules. When we get into modules, we get toward the end of this uh, session uh, as we come in. I'm gonna have to go a little bit quicker. <laughs> and there's our E and our B rack. So if I went back and I showed you this here, here's the E1-4. So we're looking forward. This is the E and E stands for Electronic and Equipments Bay under the Boeing thing. And this is looking in the ATA-91 book, charts book. And I'll show you that in a second too. So here's the E8 rack near the ceiling. Here is the E1 rack that those first little connectors was in. And then E14 would be one, two, three, fourth one down. You come across to the back. Here's the E2 rack, E3 rack, E4 rack, and the E5 rack. And you're looking at a picture here. Believe it or not, the uh, transfer rectifiers actually were moved from this particular airplane this was a, a picture I, I'm sorry they weren't they're not removed they're over here right out of the picture it's the closest picture I got I don't get much opportunity to jump on to aircraft to take pictures I would like to get more color pictures uh, but I don't work for anybody right now I didn't even when I was working at Boeing here I was assigned to the max program um, I couldn't even get into the airplanes and I certainly didn't want to take pictures at Boeing they're very touchy about photographs there so I never took any pictures so let's start at the beginning. We'll begin at the beginning, as we used to say. So we always start, in this case, at the circuit breakers. So I want to explain a little bit about the circuit breakers. Now, the location here is P6-4, so it's a panel. And then you look, in, you look at all the circuit breakers that come in here, as I show in my pointer here. And what you're looking at are DC battery bus, DC battery bus, hot battery bus, and going all the way down. The circuit breaker we want is the bus one, because this is the number one transformer rectifier. So this breaker here, it has a module number, equipment list number of C23. C23 just stands for a 2.5 amp circuit breaker. Uh, I'm still picking on this second one here. It's called DC bus indication one. We have an indication problem, right? Okay. Hey, look, there's our diagram, 243313. So we're on the right diagram. Interesting part, when you look on the 
other side of the circuit breaker. The left side of the circuit breaker is going to be the what we call the power supply side. That is from the aircraft's main bus. So in this case here, we would have to go to diagram 2461-22, and I would imagine that's probably from the AC transfer bus I showed you before, that shows how this circuit breaker gets its power that comes down. Okay, and let's see a couple other codes here. Um, here's our wire number. So there's our, you go through, what's the full wire number here? Hey, there's a test question. The full wire number here is W0044 dash, the wire name we care about, dash 0034 24. It's a 24 gauge wire. It's a single wire. Okay. Okay. Now it will go out of the panel. So here's the low control center, right? And I'll show you some picture where that's at here to a disconnect. Well, where's this disconnect? The beauty is this disconnect is not immediately located where the circuit breakers are. So we have a number up here. This number is AP0600C, and we would go to the part 91 manual, and actually it will show us in the manual where that panel is. And it's just, it's actually in the overhead bin, but I'll show you a picture of it where it's at. There's our disconnect. So the disconnect is a D4550P, we'll be looking for it. And there's the P, the plug side, I could disconnect this, and there's the J side that's mounted to the aircraft structure. So that's everything we need to know about that panel. Let's talk about where is it? How do I find the P6-4 panel? How do I find any panel? There we go, ATA chapter, and this is 0104. Um, and this is the panel diagram table. So this shows all of the P panels. In other words, the panels are de designated with the P's. So here's the panel names up here in the chart, then I'll diagram. Since we're looking for the P6, I'll get a close-up shot of that. And their associated wiring diagram if I want to troubleshoot the wiring diagram. Closer view of it. Remember we want our P6 panel. Well, we show that it's above waterline, or waistline, waterline, people call it two different things, 208. Essentially, 208 is the floor. Notice how that the door is just slightly above the floor. So it's above the floor in the cockpit. And then we go down here to the top view of the side deck, and it's um, right adjacent to the P6 and P61 panel, which is right behind the first officer seat, because the P18 is right behind the captain's seat. So now we know where the panel is. We now know where the circuit breaker is, and we now know where the panel is. So we keep on going down, and here's our diagram. I can go through and pull it up by panel, and it shows the P61 at the top, P62, P63, there's our P64, and right there, it says right here, it says air conditioning and air to air control, AC power indication. So this is where our circuit breaker is going to be. Now if I'm going too fast, say anything. And I want to stop to pause for a second because I have a good chat. It said Herman says, I've been told that 99% of the time it's a component problem and not a broken wire. And I would have to go through and tell you, yes. For the first, I would have to say, for the first five to seven years of an aircraft's life, provided it doesn't have a whole lot of modifications being done to it, yeah, for the most part, you're going to be looking at the line replaceable units, which means... For a 737, you're going to get into the fault isolation manual based on the system, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm hoping to come up with a 37, sorry, I'm hoping to come up with a 37 GemFam course of my own here pretty soon. After it gets to be about five, six, seven years old and the aircraft's going, undergoing C checks, maybe it's first D check, it's being torn apart and put back together. That's when you start having the wiring system being affected by handling. And that's what starts putting stress on it. Now, there are parts of the aircraft that where the wiring takes a lot of abuse. And we talk about those being in swap areas. Those are special emphasis areas, uh, we, which means, and I can show you the P, P91 page, those swamp areas, the wheel wells, uh, under the flaps, um, out in the um, both the leading inch flats or the Kruger flaps, in the hell hall, these are areas that are affected by heat, water, moisture, penetration areas. These are also subject to corrosion versus um, 
wiring in an aircraft, not so much, not wiring in an aircraft. Uh, when I worked at uh, my first airline, my second airline, we had older airplanes. We had really old airplanes. And our issue was also vermin. Rats and mice getting into the airplane and eating the wiring. Um, that was also kind of a problem with uh, with that. Yeah, Ben, I would I'd probably put the course together. Yeah, and Ben, you should have seen my first night. I came, true story, I came from the Air Force, um, working in C-130. So it was a big airplane, right? I was an avionics technician, but I was, a you know, in the Air Force, you have your main specialty. So I was instrument systems, but I was also cross-trained because we were... Um, our aircraft, they were, ta they were C-130s, they were TAC, which means I was cross-trained in autopilot, electrics, and uh, instruments, so I could do a lot of different systems. I show up as an avionics technician at an airline. Oh, basically, anything with a wire is yours. And my very first night, by myself, oh, there's a 737 up there with a broken audio selector line. Couldn't get any sound out of it. Go find out. Neat. I could read though. That was the beauty part. I went through and started figuring out how to read the schematics and how to read the electrical systems. Oh, your ECM on the C-130s? Yeah. There were, ours were uh, electronic countermeasures. Yeah, it was uh, 41st ECS with me. So 41st and 43rd. I guess there's two squadrons in Arizona now. Small world. My uh, dean actually was used to be the platoon. Anyway, I hope to put more pictures in here in this one this is what it looks like if you're crammed in that cockpit that's the p6 panel behind the first officer's seat lots of stuff there behind that panel uh, in fact these are the generator control units for the apu and the main engines are actually located let me put my mouse here they're actually located here on the mouse here um, and then you have behind them a lot of breakers and relays and alloys and stuff at least on the older models. The newer models now we have junction boxes and I'll show you that. So that's where we're going to be looking for our circuit breakers. And this is real simple. I need to see if I'm getting power from the breaker. And I could do two locations. Now one thing one, I am working with power on the aircraft, right? So I want to make sure my systems are operating. You tend to only put one hand, rule of thumb, only put one hand um, into the electrical area itself. You're going to connect one side to AC ground. And this one you can use your probes because that's going to be a screw on there. You are 100%. Now, the way these works is that the way the bus systems are connected together, it's not a bar. Uh, I worked on some Learjets, and Learjets had literally bus bars that connected all the, the various circuit breakers together. Boeing and Airbus, and I, I'm not sure about um, Bombardier, they use actually jumper wires to connect the positive sides of the battery. We need to check the negative side. So on my um, circuit breaker, C23, on the P64 panel, I got 20 volts. All right, good to go. Let's go to the next spot. Write that down, right? Then I'm gonna go, remember that next wire? So it's to check the wire coming from the breaker to the overhead panel. Now there is a junction box here, above, right above, the um, uh, kind of where the door is it used to be where the pilot, where the uh, I used to call the the uh, be the FA jump seat that's there. Um, there's a bank of electric connectors. That's where this APO 606T is. You could disconnect it from there, but I just say go ahead and let's go ahead and go to the overhead panel to the actual panel itself, the one that's been removed that's been in place. There's two connectors on it. And one thing I forgot to mention about the connectors is that this is the plug side. Okay, notice that it doesn't have a it does not have a P or a J on this particular unit. It does show a rounded side here. Let me show it right here in the bottom, a rounded edge here, where it says D652 at the bottom. What that's for is uh, showing that that's a plug. Because there's no D or J, it's being connected to a module. In this case, this is our overhead module. So now I can disconnect this module, right? Of course, I'll pull the breaker before you do. And then go ahead and um, connect the breaker back in again once you get it done, once you find pin 42, because you're checking 
two wires here at this time. You're checking the wire from the circuit breaker. You're checking the wire from this disconnect number to the overhead panel. If I have voltage, which means I have supply voltage, good to go, okay? So we say that we do have power there. So this is not our problem. Okay, now we make a note. We D652 was disconnected, tested, reconnect it back together. We never did take this one apart, which was awesome. If we did not have voltage here, then we would go back one. Since we do have voltage here, we keep on going. The keep on going is going to be on the outbound side now of that module. So now we need to go back to that other diagram. Oh, I forgot. I was going to show. There's the P5 panel. If you're wondering where the P5 panel is, there it is up there. So um, let's see here. Uh, I want to show a couple of, before we get too carried away, I had a couple of other uh, things that you might see on a diagram. Um, here is the J, the P in the middle here with the tip fairing. This is actually out to the airplane. Every now and then you will see an, an SM. SM stands for splices. So there is a splice on this one. I'm going to go ahead and You have to bear with me for a second while I get rid of my get rid of my uh, camera, so I can show you the rest of the diagram. The splices will be on the wiring diagram, especially if they're put in by the factory. And there's a lot of splices on the aircraft. For this example here, I've got a splice that goes to wire number 002-20. It's a, it's a different size splice, but there's a note on here. Then we would go to the notes page, and the notes page would tell us. Uh, exactly what uh, that w that wire was used for. And we could use it as a spare, but or we would just run a new wire from the splice to whatever connector this is. We could go back here. We're showing now this is the tip fairing, so this is inside. There's a note number two on here. The note number two would be another note on the wiring diagram showing that maybe this was installed as part of, a, of an engineering order. In this example here, this wire is stowed. So that's the symbol for being a wire being restowed. So pin four is now in that position B, and pin three is a stowed wire, because I guess apparently they went through and um, decided to ground pin this one, and then they put power to this one here. It's just a two pin connector. A couple of things I want to mention real quick. If you look at the very top of the connector here, see how that's a jagged line on the plug side? The jagged line on the plus side means that you're only looking at a portion of the actual electrical connector, the cannon plug. And the reason for that is because they just, you know, just want those pins and wires that affect what you're looking at. And Nicholas, yes, absolutely, this video will be republished and stayed online, well, until I until I take it off. So yes, I'll keep it going. Let's see, Ben also says, it's been a while since I was on a Boeing aircraft. Is the wire naming convention always three quarters, always location based? I would have to say the ones that come from the factory are. So even when when we would do modifications, so if you have C-Check, um, Southwest Airlines, we didn't do mods on C-Check because we just flat didn't take the airplanes apart enough. At the first airline, America West, I worked at, we had full-scale sea checks, so the aircraft were down for a week, and we could do modifications. We would stamp the wires based on the engineering orders instructions, and they would go through and um, uh, tell us to stamp it for that area. So, yes, the numbers were always based uh, on the location. Object is we've got to find the, the wire eventually. So I wanted to show here, this is a good drawing that showed uh, some splices that were put in by the factory, some splices that were put in as a result of modifications. So that's why I wanted to show that here, kind of jump in there. Okay, now we keep on going. So this is that same diagram I showed before. Okay, so I've got a couple wires that are coming out of that panel here. So this comes out of the overhead panel. So I have in pin 53 and pin 39, I have two returns. I'm done looking for wires right now, or looking for power. The rule of thumb, the way it works with troubleshooting using power, if I don't have what I would call the legacy power at the end user, okay, this went through a module. 
which means I have no idea what the power supply is going to be. It could be a signal wire. It could be an air ink signal, which means it's a plus five, negative five signal wire at that point, uh, which means I'm not looking for power anymore. Um, we do have air ink testers that do check, you know, air ink numbers on the bus. That's fine. And that's what fault isolation or the CDU can tell us in that system. But since it's just an indication, we're going to be tr physically troubleshooting the pair of wires that are running from uh, TR number, um, sorry, the TR number one indication unit in the overhead, as we talked about the P5, P5-13 was the actual number of the panel, to the rack unit on the E1-4 shelf. I showed you that before. And these are the two wires we're concerned here that go through. All the way to the E2-1 shelf right here, where TR unit number one is, to this back of the rack connector. Now I want to tell you right now, knowing what I know about wires, is that we don't go to every single connector. I would leave the connector in the cockpit undone. And now what I can do is I pull the transformer rector unit out of the aircraft. Now again, now we're at the point to where we're shutting down power. We need to have the airplane um, uh, no voltage going through this anymore at the time. We're just doing it based on our ohm meter function. And I have three drawings here. Okay, so I have a variable, I have a resistor here with a split T and then maybe another diagram that shows pin four having in there. All I care about is in D102, notice that there, notice that it's there's no um, J or P because it's next to a module, this is a module. And we're going to check between pins 8 and 9. Now remember, I have specially made jumpers made up that will go through and connect into these pins of my test unit. I am going to go to the cockpit and put my male-to-male -male jumper between pin 53 and pin 35 on the connector in the in the cockpit. The one It would, it would be the one that we were before. I could probably tell the number right here. This was... There was 53, 54, right here. Okay. Sorry. So what I'm doing is I'm making a loop. I'm checking both wires at the same time. So we're checking these signal wires. There's the wire number 25, 10, 204, 23B, moving all the way through to 141, to 212, all the way through. Okay. Now, if I go through and I put my meter on it, and I have it on the ohm function, and it's dead, ding, 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 now I have a problem. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I either check this way to the left or going back to the right. So now you have to use a little bit of intuitive thought here. Here, This is, this rack here is actually very, this physical connector is located, it's very large, it's located on the very back of the E2-1 shelf. I mean, it's all the way back there. This is actually easier to go to since this is on the E1-4, which is on the bottom, and it's a rack with just wires alone. It's easier for me to get to um, either one. Could be 4096J uh, or P going the other direction here, going up back up to the cockpit. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick on this connector here. So, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and jumper the two wires together and run my meter through here and see if it's open or short. If it's, if it's sh shorted, then my wire is good here. If it's open, then my problem's here. And then I would reconnect this connector and to go to this connector p and j and check these wires here remember though at the same time the weak link is not so much about the wires themselves the weak link is actually the connectors themselves broken wires at the back of the connectors so let me show you how to connect here if i were to go through and pull out uh, a connector and were to go through and look at it and pull on it i could bet you i could pull loose wires that are out of it and that happens quite a bit the electrical connectors, especially in the rack, if this particular rack, E1-4, it's right below the lav, it's right below the galley. Uh, coke is corrosive as heck on an airplane. So 
the issue with this is when you're troubleshooting this wire here in this rack, it's most likely it could be contaminated uh, here versus this one on the back, which is, tends to be more, yeah, well, I'll call it protected. Okay, so we're going to go through and pick on these two connectors here. Here's our E1 rack, E2, which is where our TR unit is. So we're literally troubleshooting the wiring that's running from the E1 rack around to the E2 rack all the way around. That's the section of wire. But we're also looking at the connectors. Now, wires themselves, a um, couple options. If I do have a broken wire, okay, in this example here, if I have a broken wire going back to the, uh, to the rack, a short wire, then I could run a shielded double wire, make sure it's 24 gauge. Um, if I'm in a shop that has a wiring connection, then I can go through and have wires made, but I'm going to have to also pin them. Uh, in this case here, you're showing the circulars, which means they're not shield. The shields are not grounded, which is okay. It's okay if the shields are not grounded. Okay, going across here, this is just a twisted double unshielded, so I could actually just run new wires here. The issue about running wires is that there is a chart in the uh, in the 91 manual that shows you where those wires are running. Okay, so. Uh, let's see, 8 and 5. We talked about that before. Yeah, it's 8 and 5. I thought it was 8 and 9. I'm sitting there looking without my glasses. Oh, it's focusing, focusing. Okay. So I said this here. Be sure to place a jumper on the pin side. So now we're checking here. And we're going very quickly. Okay, so now our scenario has changed. So now we're picking on these two wires here. We're dealing with two wires in a shield. You see the shield here, the symbol? Okay. This is between the TR1 feed wires from the cockpit to that first rack. And now, once I have the loop I've got down to two wires, I need to go through and isolate to one wire. So I'm going to take pin 35 and put a jumper to ground and then go check pin 4 with my red lead in pin 4 and then my other multimeter to aircraft ground. And that creates the loop to check the uh, red wire. Same thing, to check the green wire, I would put a jumper on pin 53 to ground, aircraft ground, in the cockpit, and then go down to the uh, to the equipment bay, take my red lead of my multimeter, put it in pin 14, which again, using my jumpers, and then ground the negative side of my meter to aircraft ground to see which one is open. It is more likely than not that a problem with the open wires at a connector, okay? And I need, so I want to talk about getting into connectors here in a second. We are going to inspect the wire visibly as much as we can. Okay. There is a general rule of thumb and, and I'll, um, I'll do that in my course. I have probably my, um, the course I'm kind of developing as I go along with the other course. Right now, I have to let everybody know that I am being, which is a good thing. It's a, it's a good thing to be, be wanted. Uh, with requests for other courses. People want technical courses. I just finished a basic pedostatic course that I did for Zoom, and it was a repair station that wanted uh, it for their transponder certification. So now I'm going to put that online. I'm also doing one on basic radios, so I could start doing uh, Chapter 23 for VHF Com, VOR Nav, things like that. Um, so I have a lot of, I have 650 hours of avionics material that I need to convert to this. So it's going to take me a while. Plus, I have a day job too. Okay, so if I remove the back job for D562, so 562 was up here at the P513 on the overhead, I discovered that the pin in the connector is fused and burned. Okay, and that happens. Fusing and burning is rare. Actually, electric connector, especially in a cockpit, um, more often, because of the sweat, uh, the, the uh, overhead area has a tendency to sweat, we see more corrosion in there. The weak spot of, a, of an aircraft wiring is where it's connected. Reason being is that the surface of the wire itself is tinned. It's covered in a Teflon coating. It's well protected when it runs through the aircraft. It's usually secured in a, in a way to where it doesn't rub into structure. right? So as long as it's not disturbed, these wires can stay well protected and not corrode for 
you know, 10, 20, 30 years sometimes, maybe 40 years that the wires don't work. Now, the FAA has come up with an aging aircraft inspection program to where after aircraft get to be a certain age, then they're going to require inspection of the wire systems whenever whenever there's maintenance being done in, in a certain area. So this gets it a little bit zonal because before that we didn't have an inspection program for aircraft wiring. So again, that's a whole nother class that I teach at the FAA Academy. But we're going to say for the for for this example that our P plug, which is the airplane side, has got a damaged connector, and we need to replace the whole connector. Well, first and foremost, I need a part number, right? So I need to go order the part number. Where we go is to the equipment list. And that is in um, the wiring diagram manual equipment list. Uh, it's an alphameric listing for all the components installed in the aircraft by any module. So we already talked about earlier about the circuit breakers had a C code. Here we go, some some examples. So here we got a module, which is an M. So this is a, uh, a static inverter code, uh, M9. We go down to the bottom, there's our circuit breakers. On this example here, I've got a C815. Well, this is a three-phase AC breaker. So it's, a, it's its own module number. Over here, I've got a main bus load shed relay. So this is, a, this is essentially what we call a bus tie breaker. And that has an R561. So these things will have equipment code listings that we're going to go to the alphanumerical equipment list and we're going to go get a part number from that. Okay, so for example, remember I showed you on the diagram, all of our connectors were listed as D connectors, right? So they have a D code. Okay, and there we go. So there's our listing for the D code. And I'm sorry that's not big enough, but I'll go through this very quickly. So these, uh, by alpha, alphabetical listing, now these are going to have the BACC, Boeing Aircraft Company Corporation, I forgot what it was, Boeing Aircraft Corporation's codes, the original code for the disconnect of it. Okay. Um, so we'll pick on the first one. The first one here in the diagram is a DO8648, I think it is. My eyes are not so good. Then if I go down... It's a BACC 45 FT, which means it's a an MS uh, 65800. I think I have to go look it up. Uh, but it's a specific code, right? And then it has S67 plug. These last ones talk about the fact that it's a socket. It has 65 connections in it, and it has a number seven alternate key. So these last four numbers are very, 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 care very careful. So I would get the part number here. It's a plug. I double check and make sure that it's, if here's my sheet and it shows the, uh, in this case here, it's a different, this was a different manual. So I had to go through and do a, uh, um, a different effectivity number. This would have the effectivity number of the aircraft. In this case here, it just goes slash all on the aircraft. So there it is now. I had a better print of it. So here's the BACC 45FT22. Okay, so that's that's the type of connector it is. It is a 55-pin socket. So it's the female side. And in this example, it is a alternate position 8. The vendor is Boeing in that, and when this was printed. And there's only one on the airplane. So that's this column here showing the fact that there is only one on the airplane. And it shows the drawing number in this particular example. Again, I told you that the drawing number, because ours is a 33 and this is a 28, is because my equipment list is for a different airplane. Now, Boeing no longer makes the parts. <laughs> so, so with us, we have to go... So because Boeing no longer makes the parts anymore, they've basically outsourced all their electric connectors. However, all the different companies don't use the same Boeing part number for the different air, for their connectors that they sell, which is okay because um, uh, they have a conversion code for that. So we're going to go and show you just on the example. Now, Amphenol, Pile, uh, Tyco, um, Cinch, uh, DMC, these are all um, post 
you know, contractor suppliers for the electrical connectors for aircraft. They're all MS. So as I mentioned before, a BACC 45 FT, let me show my picture here, a BACC 45 FT is a mil spec 26500. That's what I kept trying to say it, 26500. And I did have a video, or if I don't, I have another course that talks about the different mil specs of the connectors. So I'm in the right catalog. Because a BACC 45 FT is a mil spec 26500, I go to the Amphenol Pile connector. Well, it's not just enough. I just can't order it because that particular mil spec is uh, will have a thousand different variants and different types. So what we're going to do is very, very quickly, like I said, we're going to be able to, I'm going to put this into the other, other course, but we're going to go through and convert it. So in our example here, I've got an Amphenol or a BACC 45 FT connector part number structure. So this is how they do the cross reference. This is how we would order it. So if it's a 45 FN or 45 FT, okay, we either want a CA 48R, 10R, or a 16R. It depends on whether or not we need to pull a, a plug or a receptacle, if we need a P or a J. So we should know that. So that's the base number. The shell size was that second number that was on the configuration. Okay, that's the cross reference for the shell size. The insert configuration, we'll talk about that here in a second, has to do with the fact that this is a, um, a dash four configuration. I'll have to show that in a second. The next is a contact, which being, and this, they're showing just a four pin. Ours was a 54. This is a pin, or it could be an S for a socket. And then they have some specialty codes here on the end. Do you want cable support? Do you need the seal plugs? These, do you need the back shell? Things like that. This last digit here is very important. This is the alternate key position. So if we went back to our original diagram, we had a, we had a key position of eight. So this last number after the letter P or S has to be the alternate key position. Otherwise, it won't go back onto the airplane. It will not match. So a BACC 45 F10 or FN is going to be either a plug or receptacle, this first number. The shell size um, is this a dash 14, which was on the number after the FT. Four is the insert configuration. So that is four R's, could be 54, 34, whatever, whatever the number is, pin and socket. So now, where do we find the instructions on how to put this thing together? Well, Boeing tells you how to do that too. So we're going to learn about real quick ATA chapter 20. Everything that we do on an aircraft as an avionics technician, as a mechanic, has instructions for continued airworthiness created by the manufacturer, which means everything that we do on an airplane has a set of instructions built into it. And ATA chapter 20 is our instructions on how to do it. So I'm going to go through, pull that page back up. So now we're in ATA chapter 20 and we go back and we look up our BACC 45 FT. So BACC 45 FT, and then it shows different configurations after that. It's a connector, Boeing, and we go, I'm sorry, connector, Boeing right here, FT, and we go to 206111 procedure and that's a specific instructions on how to assemble this connector. So that's the purpose of losing the connector is to go through and be able to tells you how to what removal to or show you how we'll go to it. I have it. So now we go to 206111. It'll show us the pin chart. It'll show for this particular example, and I wish I had a better picture. This is literally out of the maintenance manual. Um, it shows the center connector is pinned one. As you look at it, they show a little arrow on the top. The arrow on the top here is the is what they call the master key. Uh, sometimes it's actually seen as a double key. And the way you count is numerical, which means one, two, counterclockwise on the uh, 
counterclockwise on the plugs, clockwise on the mates. So it's the regular opposite. And every tenth one will have a circle around it. So if I find number 10, there's a double circle around 10. Go up here to 20, there's a double circle. 30, there's a double circle. 40, double circle, so on and so forth. So even if the numbers are wore out, um, you still have, you have these lines in here which are printed, uh, this is a red connector with a white lines. The double circles are around every tenth one. So that how's this, that's how you're gonna go through and hook them up. In the instructions has the removal tool. Now this is a front release remove, which means we use this tool here. And there's all sorts of different part numbers, model numbers um, that are used for front release. Uh, this particular one's a DR, sorry, yeah, a, D, uh, a DRK20. It's just a, a DMC20. It tells you the crimp tool that you're going to be using. And there's your crimp tool in the tab. This is all in, this, in the uh, chart. And it tells you what part number you're doing it to. The contact size, these are 20, 20s, 18, 18s. These are just showing the two crimps. That means they're the same size for a 22 gauge wire. There's um, <coughs> a setting number on the tool. And the tool could be the big crimpers or the small crimpers. So that's why it's showed different. And the different gauge wires, 20, 20, 16, 18, and 12, 12. Uh, 20, 20 is the red setting. Um, 16, 18 is the blue setting. In other words, this is what you would put in the center setting to set the two. And then you get your parts. Remember, if you don't get an extra set of back shells. Now, just another thing I forgot to mention here. When we get into the airplane itself, on the Boeing, I always have to pick on the Boeing Airbus is a little bit the same. Certain parts of the aircraft that are not subject to vibration, they're not subject to... Um, um, you know, stress environments and things like that, they may not have back shells on them. In other words, they use the, um, the wires being tied up by the manufacturer that allow them to go through and um, not use a back shell. However, you're going to see back shells in areas um, in where there's a lot of activity, uh, near the battery compartment, out in the wheel wells. So it just all depends on... If it has a back shell, when you put it on, put the back shell back on when you put it on. Why do we take it off? Vice versa. Otherwise, you're only going to get a cap, the connector, and you get enough pins to uh, fill each hole. And uh, not every not every connector, you don't put an unfinished pin in there. If you have a connector that's uh, 32 contacts, you don't put all 32 contacts in. You only put the contacts in the connector that has a wire. If it doesn't have a wire, they want you to put a plastic plug to make this semi-waterproof. In but We go back to my diagram. Sorry about that. So here you get your part. Here's your connector. There's your contacts that you get with it. Okay, you, you get just enough contacts for every connector. What I want to go through and say is that you don't put all these contactors into the connector. The only connectors that should, the only um, metal connectors that the should technician should see are the ones that have the wires inside. Otherwise, we would put a plug in there. It's a plastic plug to retain its relatively waterproof connection. In other words, we don't want any moisture to get in here. Okay. Anytime we disconnect a connector, we need to make sure that we make a listing of what systems that we affect it. So we would go to chapter 91, 2151, which is the hookup list for each connector. By the connector number, here's a connector number here. So I should have ignored the Boeing mark. I'm not supposed to have Boeing on here. Um, you'll have a D652. And then it has every position on here. And this could particular example, pin one at a P513 location has wire number wire bundle 215 in it. It'll have exactly what diagram. And then you'll have to go through and look by diagram what 2431 is. So it'll show every 
connector and every wire that you disconnected to make sure you do the system checks to put it all back together. Okay, and this is just going down the list. There's the diagram, the effectivity, either all aircraft or some of these aircraft. We talked about effectivity before. Um, on the list, I want to go through and I'm going to close out here describing what's on this list here. We've got circuit breaker list, um, which is on the P6, sorry, the P61. If you wonder where all the grounds are on the aircraft, there's also, we have a ground list. We'll show, here's ground based, the number, what type it is. This will say this is part of terminal board 1201. And then what you do is that you would go to chapter 91 when it talks about terminal board connections and we go find it from there. How about a master bundle list? Remember I showed you the wire numbers wo210 for example this is at the e1 shelf these are all the connectors let's say you had a you know a fire and you got to replace this bundle this actually will give you the listing for all the connectors that are associated with that wire bundle on both ends it shows their location so in this case here it's the e2-1 rack and then it even shows on a chart so this one's done on a rack this is position 15 at an AEO201A, remember I told you to go to chapter number one, and I'll show you where that disconnect is. When when Boeing goes through and they build an aircraft, it's built in sections. So throughout the aircraft, all these electric connectors come to a common unit where the aircraft is broken apart. One common one is the cockpit, which is that's main units over the door over the uh, cockpit door as you go in. Then there's another one down mid cabin, and there's another one down toward the aft of the cabin that shows where all of these um, hookup connectors are. These are the places that we're going to be going to do our troubleshooting if we have to if we have to go chase wires down. And if you need some spare wires, we have a spare wire list. It tells, in this case here, this connector here, the receptacle, there's a wire line. It's sitting in plug 18. And then has a code that tells what type of wire it is and how it's terminated. Uh, trust me, after an airplane gets to be about the five, six years, those spare wires are gone. After five or six years, like I said before, when the airplanes are fairly new, unless they've been they've been you know gone through heavy modification, the wiring stays as long as it's well protected, it's secured, um, it stays relatively unscathed. It's when the wire starts becoming handled that you really get a problem. Can you make a video on how to make your jumper testing wires? I could probably show it. I'll just show a quick video and, um, and put it out there. Um, I do have, actually I do have all the Daniels kits. So I'll give an idea to show you how to do it. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that in chapter uh, 91, there's the terminal strip list. If you want to find out what wires on a particular terminal strip, the disconnect bracket list. Uh, I actually have that listed twice. And that's all I wanted to show you on that one. So, thanks everybody. Let me go back to my, let me go back to me. I just want to go back to me. That's not everything, but it's a sample of what it's like to chase down a wire and a connector in a typical air carrier aircraft. Um, it's not, I think if I want to say the hardest part, one of the hardest parts for me is one getting access to the aircraft <laughs> obviously because everybody you know if it's on the gate uh there's not a whole lot you could do if it's if there's passengers getting on or passengers getting off you don't want to as a technician you don't want to be tracing wires at that point you're going to work your best to try to get the airplane deferred and get it down the road uh, but if you have it on an overnight then your planning comes to mind because you have to figure out how to get access to where these wires are the hardest access areas for me, uh, it gets worse as I get older, um, is in the equipment bay behind the racks because it's a very tight location. There's a lot of boxes and things. Uh, and that means it gives you a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, I'd probably have to say time judgment. If that airplane's got to fly in the morning, your boss is going to be mad at you if you got everything tore apart on it. 
Can you give examples on using a megalometer in troubleshooting? Megalometers are very, very careful. They only are used for troubleshooting high resistance bonds. A megalometer puts a high amount of voltage across, um, let's say, uh, for probably the most common one you're going to see for megalometer is um, uh, the static wicks. You'll test the bonds between the static wick. Use a megalometer also for the ba bond grounds between the antenna and the antenna base, the aluminum part of the aircraft. Uh, that's the point of a megalometer. They used to be called, you know, shield testers. They also talk about, um, they use a megalometer for leakage of wires that are running underground, things like that. Megalometers, that's all they're used for, for high bond uh sort of checks just to make sure you're you're um making sure you have a good electrical bond between a component and a surface like i said the static wicks or the antenna so i think any other questions uh see so see that not a whole lot there that's a pretty you know like i said i keep not, not quite double i need to be a 16 uh people to double my watches but I've actually been seeing that these videos keep going now the last question I had and I hope that person is here today that talked about a very quick question on where to find study material on um, one of the NCAT uh, add-on radians for uh, autonomous navigation so what I have to do is I have to go through and pull up one of my files here, bear with me, on autonomous navigation. So, um, the problem, and it's, it's not a big deal, but the problem is on modern aircraft, what they consider autonomous navigation um, was basically, I would call it the basic flight instruments. The autonomous navigation, and bear with me here, I'm going to open, I'm trying to get the uh, the uh, certification opener real quick because I actually have a copy of it. Hang on. There we go. Don't hope it'll lose you. Okay. I did write one of my textbooks based on the autonomous navigation check. And what it was was the fact that um, oh, come on Bruce. What it was <coughs> Here we go. I have it. Yay, I found it. Okay. All right. Then they wanted to think it was modern aircraft. So, this is down the list of what they consider um, autonomous navigation. One, central air data computer. Okay. In modern aviation, central air data computer now is digital air data computer. Um, the air data computer itself, I actually talk about air data computers in my um, uh, pedostatic class. But the issue with it is now it's changed to the ADIRU. So now what we used to be the air data computer is now combined with the inertial reference unit, which is now the ADIRU. And AHARS is another one where it's been coming. So the central air data computer now has been change to modern aircraft to you know, AHARS and ADIRU. Uh, originally it was chapter 3412 in the um, in the 727 manual I found it. In the 737 manual it was chapter 3416. Distance measuring equipment, they consider that part of uh, autonomous navigation. This is a good one. Auto flight, autopilot, and flight director. Um, again, a lot of those test questions that I see on the NCAT certification, I had an entire class on autopilot. We did uh, GA autopilot and air carrier autopilot. We learned both about position-based autopilot and rate-based autopilot systems for my class. So I had a whole class on that. I do not have a book for that specifically other than the PowerPoints I did for class. Uh, flight display, I would like to think of it as the uh, attitude indicator heading indicator, turn coordinator. So it's the gyro parts of it. They also include weather radar system. Again, uh, for me, the program I taught, weather radar was my, uh, what we call pulse radio principles. Pulse radio principles is 
uh, one of the radio systems that sends a signal out and then based on a reply of that signal, transponder, weather radar, radio oximeter, DME, that was a different class that I taught. Uh, and then the other one was area navigation. So in my book, my textbook, um, Avionics Technician Handbook, Volume 1, I didn't get a chance. To, volume 2 was supposed to cover... Um, uh, volume two is supposed to cover weather radar autopilot flight director and stuff. I just, I do have weather radar in uh, a textbook for pulse radio systems. Okay. So I do cover area navigation, compass systems, which is also covered in autonomous mm -hmm. navigation. And you've seen some of that in my, uh, in my other programs, uh, the other books that I put out together. And then DME, actually, I consider it, uh, I actually put it in part of my radio navigation system. Okay, so that's it. The answer to your question is it's old, it's antiquated, but my uh, five of four or five sections in my avionics navigation handbook covers that mm -hmm. subject. And I will start. I, what I'm going to probably do is I'm going to go through and pare those books down over time into their ATA codes. So, so they talked about. Um, um, INS, inertial navigation systems, um, for the most part, just to kind of tell you all, the reference itself actually is pretty much the test. So um, I, because I could go with like pedostatic system, they talk about system tie-ins. Well, obviously an air data computer is tied to pedostatic. So let's see. And, then, and that one should answer the question. Uh, to go through and look at the at the autonomous navigation rating, I hope you have it. I don't. It's published in my avionics technician handbook, but they do keep going through and do it. So, how many uh, questions does the NCAT add-ons have? Last time I checked, uh, like I said, they were 50 questions, as opposed to the 70 questions on the other one. And um, in ASTM had changed the rules now. On your AET. Now remember, you can't take the add-ons until you pass the AET, which is fine, right? But they want to have you get an add-on rating every couple of years to get your a, your NCAT certification to keep it alive, standard. In other words, in their mind, if, I, if apparently because I haven't done any of the add-on ratings, my NCAT certification now is expired. What does that really mean? Well. Not much. I mean, to me, your NCAT certification was designed to open the door anyway. So the object was, it really was never supposed to be a standalone training. It was supposed to be able to you to get a certification to get a job in avionics to say, hey, to my employer, I understand this base knowledge. And then we go from there. So um, uh, otherwise, to double check me, you go to ASTM website. And then type in NCAT AET, and then they'll they'll have information on the testing, where to go take the test. Um, I understand now they also have changed the test system now to where they actually will do a proctored test, which means they'll set you up wherever you are and uh, proctor a test remotely. So actually, I kind of like that. So you don't have to go to the testing centers per se. So they kind of made it easier. And I'm pretty sure that the new change in the 147 that was the other rule that was coming up. If anybody had seen my videos, that we have changes to the 147 coming out in the 21st of September, which is what, a week? Yeah, a week from Wednesday. There's going to be huge changes in, one, uh, in the uh, mechanic school certification. So the test standards haven't changed, but how AMT schools administer the schools have changed. So if you get your AMP the old-fashioned way, in other words, 30 months experience, and then go to the FA and get signed off to take the writtens, and then after you're done with the writtens, go take the rules and practicals. Yeah, that hasn't changed. But instead of spending two years at a college or a school, now they've cut that down to performance-based. And I, as an instructor, I worked at a I worked at an AMP school for coming up on 10 years. I don't know how that's going to work out when you have no longer limits on class, you have online school now, and you're going to have, you know, I'm going to have students come, to, if I was an instructor, and have students come up and say, 
test me, test me, test me. And that's all I'd ever do, you know. It was already hard enough when I had 25 students in an A&P class to try to get them to work within the curriculum. Now I'm going to have 50, 60 students that are going to be on 50, 60 curriculums or 50, 60 programs because each will be on their own individual time. So I have no idea how that's going to work out. So we will worry about that later. I should go. Yeah, should have gotten it years ago. I'm going to the AET convention in Reno next month. Okay, awesome. Yeah, good luck to you, uh, uh, Ben. Um, yeah, try to push. But right now I do... I do a 145 repair station certification class and I got good good feedback on that. And like I said, and I also provide technical training. I would like to try to get to AEA here pretty soon, but um, like I said, I'm also being tagged to be a corporate mechanic. I find out that actually p pays pretty good too. So I am going to go ahead and close this off. This has been an hour and a half. I hope that this presentation has been of worth to you. Or at least, if anything, it gives you, you know, you know, come say, hey, Bruce, I want a class on this and this. If I get enough attention, then those are the classes that I want to concentrate on developing. It takes me a lot of time and effort to develop these courses. With that being said, um, like I said, you go to my website at it's uh, avionics-education.thinkific.com and you'll see my courses that are going up there already. Now, I really am not offering the NCAT AET anymore just simply because um, I'm just not getting enough attention on it to justify paying for it for the service. But what I did, because the NCAT AET had, um, basically it was FAR 147 basic electricity generals. So I took all the videos, there's 50 videos on there for AMP basic electricities for the general's test. That, if you, if you, are working at a school going to AM or going to some other school and they don't really have a good um, avionics trained person to teach their avionics or that say avionics their basic electricity course you may want to look into my online course um, because you can take it at your own pace and you can go through and uh, take it multiple times you can actually go through and look at videos multiple times now what I did on my Thinkific program is I replaced the NCAT practice questions for the FAA test questions. So I'm hoping they get some get some attention there. Well, it has been fun. Thank you for the comments. I wish you guys um, the best of luck out there. Um, please share this video. It will come, it'll be published tomorrow morning. It'll be uh, permanently put out there for the world to see. And then um, uh, I'll come up with something new i just need uh, hints this this uh troubleshooting wire was based on your comments somebody had asked me how to put one together so with that being said until next time share subscribe and like it keep it safe